Welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. The views and opinions expressed on Stories of Amazing Grace are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the Madison Church of Christ or the producer of this program. Enjoy. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Larry Souter, and welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. We're coming to you from Bixler Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us on YouTube, and you also can catch excerpts of some of these shows on radio by going to worldchristian.org, so be sure and do that. And thank you for our live audience. We have a special guest tonight. I say that every time because they are special. This one I've known for the past 20 years, not a whole lot of association during that time, but uh, we know one another for uh, since 20 years ago. We used to do a TV show out of this building in what is now the preschool department over in another wing called ID21. And we'll show you some clips of that a bit later. But uh, by way of introduction, rather than me get up here and talk too much about her, except I will say this, during the time we were doing the show, uh, and I still think that, she's a very spiritual individual, loves the Lord, loves God, loves Jesus, has uh, great hopes for eternity in heaven, as we hope that we all do. But uh, at the time, that's, that's what I thought, but I did not know her past that much, which was maybe a little bit opposite until I read this book called Above Reality, Where Miracles Happen and Healing Begins. And uh, I think you will, will enjoy that. I hope that you'll get a copy afterwards. But uh, give you some insights about her life and uh, the music business in general and those seeking stardom and how she, has, she found the Lord, and how the Lord has worked in her life for so many years. So I think, I think you'll enjoy that. Our theme scripture comes from Romans 8, 38 through 39, as it does each week. I am sure that nothing can separate us from God's love, not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present nor the future, and not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Rather than go on and on about uh, Susan Meredith with me doing the introduction, Todd Hibbs put together a great introduction that ran uh, in the church auditorium the past two Sundays with Carol Bellis doing the talent. Is she here? She's going to miss her debut on the screen. She is. Oh, there she is. Okay, you can speak. I know you can speak. So we're going, to, we're going to play that again, and then we're going to dovetail into some clips of Susan singing, uh, hosting a show on Channel 39, and some clips from ID21. So we'll do that, and then we'll interview Susan Meredith Byer. Will? And coming up Wednesday on Stories of Amazing Grace, Susan Meredith Byer. She's co-writer of the Christian stage play Tin Boom, the musical, based on the life of Corey Tin Boom. Now, she also performed all across America and abroad for many years on concert stages and major television shows. In 1984, a profound, heart-changing experience in Jesus Christ led to many years in broadcasting as host-producer of three talk shows for the Christian Television Network, a show with Whispering Bill Anderson and another stint coordinating events for national religious broadcasters. In 2007, she wrote her first book, Above Reality, where miracles happen and healing begins. Susan's pursuit of stardom nearly cost her everything. Then she says God spoke four words and everything changed. Come hear Susan share her story of amazing grace, Wednesday, August 2nd, 6.30 in Bixler Chapel. This is what happened to me. Oh, Satan made me an offer. He promised great fortune and fame He said my picture would be on front pages And all the country would know my name So I traveled the whole world over Yes, and I sang in the bright lights and the bars now I won't trade the old rugged cross To sing your cheating heart Wake it up, the morning sun Why? 
John Wyatt is a man who believes he has discovered the Ark and various other uh, scriptural artifacts. We have found uh, remnants of all three decks uh, on the boat. It's actually two scale. It isn't That's a right. scale model, but it is two scale. Don't spend money you don't have. It's no. that simple because the borrower's servant to the lender. Give us this day. Welcome to ID21. Thanks. Susan has a whole lot more financial problems than I have, so I'm going to let her ask the first question. <laughs> Money. Ooh. Yes. Have you got any samples? <laughs> That's right. We bring them with us. So these roses, cut very low, are going to last for much longer than if they were left on a long stem. Well, I'll remember that. If anybody ever gives me long stem <laughs> roses, I'll figure That's they'll be why. dead in the morning. And one interesting thing, healthy families have just as many crises. They just deal with them in a better way. It was always dangerous, your business, but, but much more so now. Why? Well, I think, I think it's the lack of values in America. Obviously, the increase in crime. So we visited the former Hee Haw star in her Nashville home recently, and we talked about her life, we talked about her career, and we talked about the drugs that she formerly took, every kind of drug. Most importantly, we talked about her love for God. What did you call this stuff? This is Lipton Tropical Tea. That is too fine. Isn't that wonderful? Too fine. Big That's lot special. Uh, he's a carpenter by trade, and uh, he's a man that knows also about inner city things and about breakdown in the family, but he knows about success as a singer. His name is John Prim. I was born in Mississippi in a crowded one room shack. I grew up picking cotton on the wrong side of the track. Welcome back. This is our Just for Fun segment, and uh, in this segment, you're going to learn how to call pigs. Here, piggy, piggy, piggy. Here, Susan, Susan, Susan. That's right. <laughs> we had quite, <laughs> a, quite a tragedy here a while ago. We did. It's your fault. And uh, we have it on tape. We're going to show you that after a while, but uh, the lasagna yeah. exploded. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how long it took me to cook that thing? A long time. It did. It looked real good, I too. spent hours. Really? And the glass just... <clears throat> We <laughs> turned it off. <laughs> that looks real good, Susan. You got plenty of roughage in there, I tell you that. <laughs> well, please make welcome the best lasagna chef in Nashville, Susan Meredith Meyer. Thank you. Wow, our hair has changed. <laughs> Mine has, and I just don't have any. Too. Look at that show. I'm well, glad you can make it. Thank you. It's been been a long time. Thank you. I still walk and everything. Do you have any so. good memories from that show other than the lasagna? You know, I do. I really enjoyed it. It was it was a lot of fun. Just uh, oh, the music, the different people that came in. There's always, you know, what what always strikes me is when you do television shows like that, uh, Christian shows, there's so many ways people know the Lord and minister to the Lord. We had three segments on that show. Uh, let's see if I can think what they were. <laughs> Life Matters, yeah. uh, Just for Fun, yes. and That's Entertainment. Yes. So, uh, and some of those people, you, you don't know, but the, two of those people are, are elders here at the Madison Church who probably... Wish they hadn't appeared on that <laughs> show at the time. <laughs> well, but they have changed a little bit over the years, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, Buck Dozier and uh, Frank Scott were, yeah. were two of the, the gentlemen on there. It was fun. We met a lot of people. We did. We had there were, there were several guests in the community. We also had the best-looking set. Madison, was, Madison Church did that. Yeah, yes, they did. And uh, I don't know if Susan Mises is in the room or not, but she had, had a lot to do with that, as, as well as did other people. Yeah. Tell us about uh, your family, a very religious family, loved God. 
not, not so. No. No, <laughs> no uh, unfortunately, my family did not know the Lord, did not go to church, and didn't want to hear about it. So, But your uh, father was musical. My dad was. He yeah. was uh, for many years, he was a concert violinist. And uh, he taught my two sisters and I to sing. Uh, because he was so musical. He taught me to play a ukulele. I was hoping he'd play, teach me to play violin, but I didn't get to that. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, they didn't know the Lord, and they didn't, uh, they didn't think we needed to. Were you seeking the Lord at all during that time yourself? You know what? Somebody said that I must have always been kind of spiritual, I mean, drawn. Uh, the first song I ever wrote, I was 12 years old, and I wrote a song, I don't know what I had done, I must have done something really, really awful, because I went in my bedroom and I wrote a song called um, uh, Don't Let Me Go Down Below. Don't Let Me Go Down Below? <laughs> below? You mean below? Yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm a sinner and maybe I'm not. I hear you calling and your voice is hot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Don't let me go down below. That was it. Let me, let me open that for you. you no, down. I got it open. I'm afraid okay, I'll right. spill right. it. So. And uh, you, you sung with your sister for a while? I sang with both of my sisters. Both your sisters, sorry. Yeah. My dad fought with us to learn how to sing, and we sang barbershop type songs, you mm. know, Sweet Adeline, things like that. And it was real pretty, but we about killed each other fighting all the time. Who was going to sing what part? And so. Well, tell us how you got into the uh, the music business and seeking fame and fortune by singing. Well, you know, in school, I wanted from the time I saw my first movie and my first television, I wanted to be a singer and I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to act. I could die better than anybody in the world in my bedroom. You know, I practice all the time, and so. I knew I was going to be a star one day, and uh, I never got there, but I, I hoped for that. And uh, so it was so, I guess in school I did several musicals. I sang with a dance band, and I sang with some professional orchestras around San Francisco. But I was 14 years old, trying to dress like I was 18. I was a little lost girl trying to be a big girl. And you were discovered? Well, no. I made a very big mistake. I got married when I was 17, 18 years old. And by the time I was 23, I had three beautiful children and a divorce. Mm. So um, I thought I would never sing again. You know, I was too busy raising children. Mm -hmm. But uh, one night, I was in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. My children had moved from California. That's where I'm from, California. And um, we had moved out there, and I was selling real estate. And one of the realtors was a, um, a band leader. Mm -hmm. And he called me up one night. To, he said, come on over to the club and sing a song. So I did. And Coach Devaney was the coach of the Big Red then, and Big Red Nebraska team. And he apparently liked what I did, and he kept bringing in his friends, and he kept asking me to come and sing. Nobody paid me anything, but I was singing, and I got discovered um, by a uh, country concert promoter. Now, I wasn't country. I was like a, I was doing um, pop Cross music, mostly pop crossover. music. Crossover? Not even crossover. Okay. I was doing Carly Simon, Barbara Streisand, okay. and, and people I can't even sing like now. But um, I did those things um, until this guy found me, and he wanted me to sing country music. He said, I can make you another Linda Ronstadt, if that tells you when that was. So, anyway. And you bought into it? I did. I bought into it. Well, real estate, the, the interest was about 11.5% at that time. So anyway, he put me out on the road with a five-piece band. 
We toured for a long time, and at some point, um, I met Whispering Bill Anderson out on the road. You want to know about that? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's, there, is. there yeah. it is. That I would be the one on this side mm -hmm. in the hat. And uh, we traveled for four years. Uh, I was with him, uh, I hate to say the years, but 78 to 82. I traveled with Whispering Bill, and I was one of the Poe folks. Mm -hmm. And it was fun. We, did, we actually did a soap opera. ABC New York uh, wanted to recreate the Grand Ole Opry for part of one of their uh, One Life to Live. And you were on Tonight Show, Merv Griffith Show, yes. Hee Haw, Hee -haw. Grand Ole Opry, yep. Mike Douglas. One Life to Live. Yes. Just like I would say last week, I went to McDonald's, Subway, Hardee's, <laughs> Burger King. Yeah. That, that's how common it was for you. Well, it was at the time. It was kind of fun. Yeah. But you know what? I was the emptiest human being I knew. I was really unhappy. I had three kids sitting at home waiting for me. And I was out there in show business. I mean, you, you can have some fun. Mm. You, there's, there's fun times. And it's fun meeting all those people. I don't know if any of you remember Richard Dawson, who used to kiss all the women. Well, he kissed me on the cheek. <laughs> So, anyway, that was one of the highlights at that point. But, um, <clears throat> no, we, uh, we traveled so much that I felt like I was really neglecting my children. What was your band's name called? The Men in My Life. The Men in Your Life? Mm-hmm. Okay. I couldn't think of a good name for them, and, and uh, so I look back and I see these are the men in my life. And, and where did your name come from, Susan Meredith? Susan Meredith. Well, I never had a real name. Never had a real name? No. Okay. Uh, my family name would have been Parker. My Parker? dad's real father died okay. when he was nine months old, so he was, he was adopted by a man named Croup, like the cough. Croup. And, uh, Croup. Yeah, Croup. I see why you didn't stick with that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in school, that was a hard name to have, you yeah. know, because you can really make a mess of that yeah. name, you know. So you can imagine. But um, anyway, no, he, um, he always wanted to go back to Parker, but he never did, so I was stuck with this name, Croup. And uh, so in, uh, when I was married, the name didn't seem to work very well, so... When I was discovered, this guy said, um, well, let's not use your first and middle name. It sounds too French. Susan Michelle, that's my real name. And uh, so he said, we've got to give you something real middle of the road for country music. And a girlfriend, I called her, she was from Atlanta, and I said, what's your middle name? She said, Agnes. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I don't think so. So um, she said, she called me back. She says, I'm looking at this bill of lading and it's Meredith Street. How about Susan Meredith? And we bought it. So I've been Susan Meredith. So it was a street name. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Pretty romantic, huh? Yeah. Better than Agnes. Yes. Uh, you traveled a lot and you stayed in motels and there was a Gideon Bible in a motel. Yeah. Tell me about those Bibles that you saw in the motel room. Yeah, you don't always find those in motels anymore, but um, I used to use mine, I, I had a, like a tackle box for my makeup, and I would use those books and Bibles as a prop, isn't that terrible, for my makeup case lid. Well, I finally decided to read one. Well, the only thing we had at home when I was a kid was uh, a King James the dusty old King James Bible. And that's all I knew about a Bible. I didn't know there were several types of Bibles. I didn't know a King James Bible was anything but a King James Bible. You know, mm -hmm. there, was, there was no American Standard or NIV or whatever. So um, one night I was sitting there and I tried to read. I kept getting to the begats and I'd stop. Well, we'd travel some more. I'd pick up another Bible. I try, you know, I thought, and I think if you've been in church all your life, you don't realize that a lot of people 
have never looked at a Bible. And so they think it's like a book that you just start in the beginning, you get the plot, and you go on. But of course, it's 66 books. And uh, I didn't know where to find Jesus. I had never heard of the Holy Spirit. It really is a parallel world. You know, there was no Bible bookstores in my life. No Bibles, no Christian friends. So, so that was a hard one for me. But then one night, uh, I was riding down the highway with uh, my band, and uh, my road manager was, <clears throat> he was driving the van, and he said, Susan, uh, why don't you read the Bible? Because I was sitting there reading some novel. And he said, why don't you read the Bible? And I said, well, why don't you mind your own business? And, but I, it, it kind of ate at me. You know, I kept, why don't I read the Bible? Why can't I read the Bible? So it was only a couple of days later, I go into my motel room, and there's this good news for modern man, if you know what that is. It's kind of a paperback Dick and Jane version of the New Testament. And I began to read it. But I wasn't a real, I wasn't the kind of reader that knew the authors, and I didn't look at the headers, and I didn't look at the table of contents. So I didn't see that it was actually a Bible. Mm. And uh, so I read through this first chapter, and then I read the second. And finally, I got down to where <clears throat> I read the book of Acts. Well, I got on the, on the bus this one day, and I told my um, road manager, I said, I don't understand this, and I slammed the book down. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, well, who did this Jesus think he was, God or something? <laughs> and he just looked at me and went, just a silly smirk on his face. And I really got to thinking about that. Well, there was a lot more road ahead of, of me at that point. So I, I wasn't ready to find the Lord, but I was interested. And you became so interested that later you sought a church to go to on one Sunday night. <clears throat> but you had some disappointments there. Tell me about that. Do you remember that story? If not, I can get the book here and share it with you. But it's a, over on the... Pennington Den area, I believe. Well, see, now you didn't remember it, right? It was actually a morning. It was a Sunday morning. Oh, Sunday that's right, that's right. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it was a Sunday morning, and uh, actually I was sitting at home. This happened in two phases. I was sitting at home on a Sunday morning and thinking my whole life was miserable. My three children were growing up away from me, and... It was scaring me to death. And my music, I thought, wasn't that satisfactory at that time. I looked across Briley Parkway, and there was a cross on top of, sticking up through the trees. It was on a steeple. And I looked across, and I saw it, and it drew me. And I went and got in my car, and I drove across on Lebanon Road into Donaldson. And I looked for that steeple, and I found it. It was actually a Donaldson a Methodist Church. And, but the service was over. So I thought, well, I'll go back that night and I'll, um, I'll go to the service at, at the 6 o'clock. Well, nobody showed up. I thought, I can't even do that right. And I thought, I will never go to another church again. They don't even come. You know. <laughs> so I went back home and I told... Uh, my daughter, I was not going to try to go to church ever again. Well, the next Saturday, I get a call from Bill Anderson's front man. He was a funny kind of a guy with a buzzsaw voice. And uh, I said, I, he said he needed some music. Well, I said, I can meet you tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, if you like, and I'll give it to you. And he said, no, I'm going to Two Rivers Church. And uh, I was so angry about that cross business and them not showing up. And I thought, I'm going to church. I'm 
I'm going to go to church and I'm going to tell God what I think of him. I really, I was the most arrogant girl. And uh, I was a road girl. I mean, I'd been on the road a long time. And I did go with them that next day. But I sat there in the pew. And I guess it would be like where the lady in the orange dress is, the orange top. And they kept saying, scoot over, and they moved us in. And I got so scared because I couldn't get out. There were people, and they, it seemed like their knees went right to the pew in front. And I couldn't get out, and I started to have, like, claustrophobia. I didn't know what an invitation was. I didn't know how to be in church. So I was 41 years old. You would have thought I knew, but I didn't know. And I, they kept scooting us in. I sit there just long enough that I'm thinking, I'm going to leave this place. These people are goody two-shoes. This is not real. I mean, I saw a man put his arm around his wife, an elderly man. I saw children talking sweetly and whatever, and I thought, this is so wonderful, but it's not the truth. This is not right. I never saw this. So I was going to leave, and the minute I tried to move, I went deaf. You went deaf? I went deaf. The little pastor was up on the, st on the platform, and he started to talk, and I couldn't hear him. I couldn't hear the rustling in the room or the air conditioners or anything anymore. And I thought, oh, if there is a God, maybe he made me deaf. But it made me mad, and so... I sat there for a minute, and I tried to think what to do, and I hear this voice right next to my ear, you're going home, Susan. And I, I got so scared, and I thought my, my clothes showed my heart beating. It was that, that frightening. And I sat back and I tried to look and I thought, no, it's somebody behind me. Somebody's talking to a Susan behind me. But I knew it was not. It was something else. And I sat there for a minute and pulled myself together and then I heard the pastor's voice and he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But then he went on from there and he said 17. John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. I needed to be saved. So I sat there a minute again, and I thought, no, I'm not going to fall for this stuff. I'm, this is silly. This is silly. <laughs> I went deaf again. And then he said it again. Only this time it was in my head, and it was the sweetest, most authoritative voice. 30, 35, male, clear as a bell. You're going home, Susan. I had just written a poem about the road and about wanting to go home. I wanted to go home to my children. And I couldn't get there. And he's telling me I'm going home. I thought about that a lot, you know, after, because what did he mean I was going home? Am I going to die? Am I going to die and go to heaven right now? Well, I didn't die. And I found out that going home was a process. You know, it's a process of getting through all the things in our lives, all of the trials. And every time you have a victory, you're going home. And one day we will go home. That's what's important. Can I play devil's advocate for a minute? Sure. Some people watching this are going to say, what? She's crazy. She just heard voices. She was frustrated and angry. And 
this is just in her head. How do you respond to that? You know, that was 34 years ago. And it's as clear to me now as it was then. He said it. I, and he, why, do we, why are we surprised by the things God can do? You know, 180 degrees, my mind changed. I spoke like a sailor. I couldn't stand hearing a swear word after that. I wanted to be in church. I'd never done that really before. I wanted to help people. I wanted to love people. I had gotten so hard out on the road, I didn't want to love anybody. I couldn't even cry. In fact, sitting there in that pew, it made me cry, finally, after a couple of years. But I had gotten so hardened, running four hairy-legged old boys up and down the road, playing music. And I cried, and it was real, and it was true. It wasn't just an emotional thing. It was a complete flip-flop in my whole perspective on life, something I couldn't have dreamed up, and this is what happened. I went home that day. I don't even remember going home. I mean, it was like, what do I do with that? What do you do with that kind of an experience? And what does it mean? And now... Do I just come to church? What do I do? Well, Tuesday, that was Sunday, Tuesday, a lady knocks on my door, and I knew and I knew she was from that church. And I started to cry the minute, she, minute I opened the door. She was an older lady that, that worked in the children's ministry. And I couldn't stop bawling. I just I said, you're from Two Rivers. And she said, yes, how did you know? And I said, I don't know, but I come in. She did. I told her what had happened. She sat there with me on the couch. And she said, Susan, do you know the plan of salvation? I had no clue what she was talking about. She said, has anybody prayed with you to receive Jesus Christ into your heart? And I said, no. <clears throat> she said, do you want that? And through all this blubbering, I told her, yes, I know I need that. So she arranged for me to be baptized. We sat there for a while. She did lead me to the Lord. But I panicked. Uh, after she left, she said, now this is going to be an awful week. She said, Satan is going to bombard you. He is going to hit you with everything he's got because he, he wants you. He does not want you to finish your baptism to uh, go on with this, with, with Jesus. Just expect it. Well, boy, was she right. My coffee pot broke down. My uh, toaster broke, blew up, actually. There was all kinds of things that went wrong. My children were mad at me, and, and everything seemed to, to get all sideways with everybody. The bill collectors came and knocked on the door. Nobody ever knocked on my door to ask for payment of something. And then I get this thing. In the middle of the night, I hear this woman yelling downstairs, screaming, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. And... I listened, and this man was just raging at her and threatening. And she was crying and screaming. And I called the office, and I said, there's somebody downstairs that is going through a terrible time, and I think that young lady is going to die if you don't do something. Well, they didn't call me back till the next morning. And that was the night manager. She called the day manager, and the day manager called me, and she asked me to repeat the thing I did. She said, Susan, there has been nobody in that apartment for three months. And I thought, she, and then I remembered what she said about Satan will use every while to try to deter you. And I thought, I've known a lot of saviors in my life, people I thought were saviors. 
Even my music was kind of a savior for me. And I wasn't going to let the Lord go away from my life now. And I wasn't going to let Satan have the rest of it. So I went to my baptism. And in the baptistry, I prayed and I prayed. I squeezed my, my eyes shut. This was the next Sunday. I just squeezed my eyes shut. And I told the pastor that, uh, just wait, wait. And I prayed and prayed and I thought, I've got 99.9% .9 of me believes what happened. Take away that last little teeny bit of doubt. About that time, he plunged me under the water. And this will be more hard to believe. But it's an absolute, by God, by Jesus truth. When I went under that water, it was like I wasn't in the baptistry anymore. I was in a pool, a forest pool. When I was a kid, we used to go swimming, and I liked to swim underwater all the time. And I loved laying on the bottom and looking up and seeing the glittery sun on the top of the water. And I laid there for the longest time in that pool. It must have been 10 minutes. And I'm underwater. And it's OK. And I'm breathing, I think, because I wasn't drowning. And this feeling came over me that was like the purest thought, the purest love. I had had all kinds of financial problems, all kinds of pain in my life, a lot of hurtful things. But laying there in that pool, I didn't have a care in the world. And I thought, this is a taste of heaven. I explained it more fully in the book. We don't have time for that. But that's what happened. And when I came up out of that water, I guess it was just a dunk, slam dunk. <laughs> But when I came up out of that water, I knew and I knew and I knew, Jesus is Lord. There's some other God things that happen in your life, but I don't yeah. know if we can cover all these, but uh, you said you saw an angel on the bus. <laughs> I did. I tell think, us, tell us quickly I about that. because tomorrow. I was such a hard nose. The Lord was really doing some things in my life. And I, uh, I couldn't get a job. When you've been on the road that many years singing, uh, nobody wants to hire you. And I had pretty good skills. I could type like 90 words a minute. I learned that in school. And I thought, well, surely somebody will hire me. Well, I finally uh, went for an interview at Belmont University. It was Belmont College then in the education department. and. Um, I got on the number two Belmont bus coming out of there. Now, I was sick that morning. I had the flu so bad, but I had to make that interview. So I came back, but I was depressed. That was the first time. I mean, it had been months and months and months. I didn't think I'd ever be depressed again. How many have ever been just so slap happy in Jesus that you, you don't think you'll ever get the smile off your face? Well, it's like that day, I couldn't get the smile back on my face. And I was really having a pity party. So I get on this bus. We go a couple blocks down the street, and this wonderful black lady gets on. Now, she's a street person, a little taller than me. Now, I, I didn't want to sit with anybody. I kept telling the Lord, because I had prayed every time I got on a bus while I was looking for jobs that, that I'll give me somebody to tell about Jesus. But that day, I said, don't give me anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. Well, there were two people in the back of the bus, and I was sitting on a sideways seat in the front behind the driver. So he stops, and this lady comes on. Well, as hard as I was trying to be miserable, she was so funny, I couldn't, you know, it was, it was hard not to smile. Well, she came up the steps. She's carrying these bags, just plastic bags full of whatever. And she had this broad, 
Cheshire cat smile and teeth and had knit hats, just three or four of them just jammed down. She had to wear her wardrobe and sweaters just straining at the buttons across the front of her and these big like, like uh, logger boots. She comes up the steps and she had, I mean, two other people in the bus. She could have sat anywhere, but she wanted to sit right next to me. So she sits right down, and I just tried to smile. And I thought, Lord, if you want me to talk to her, I will, but I don't want to. And she started to talk. She was the most interesting, funny human being um, I could have had come on the bus that day. And she sat there and told me about everything in Nashville. The Union Station was about to become a hotel. She told me all how they were going to do that. Uh, she told me all about the buses and the people and places she'd been. And she sits there for just long enough that they stop the bus again. She says, well, I got to get off, she says, just about like that. And I had not said a word to her. I mean, she, every time I tried to say something, she would interrupt, and I'd end up <coughs> saying nothing. So she goes down the stairs, dragging these bags, and um, she turned around on the steps. And she came up toward me, and now she had a more serious look on her face. She had done nothing but smile the whole time. And she has this serious look on her face, and I'm feeling bad because I didn't witness to her, and now she's going to be lost. Well, she put her hand on my knee. She said, don't you ever stop talking about him. I hadn't said anything about him. And then she said it again, but she looked right in my eyes, right through me. She says, don't you ever stop talking about him. She turned around. I realized she didn't have those bags with her. She went down the stairs. I'm just sitting there with my mouth open. I look out the door, I look out the windows, and she was not on the street. Remember in Hebrews it says, you'll meet some. They're out there. And God gave me one. She was a wonderful Cheshire cat looking old black lady that made me laugh on a day that I was miserable. I want to save his time for Corey Ten Boom, but one more story. Maybe we can shorten it. It's about the, how you got your job at Channel 39. I thought that was interesting. Okay. T tell me a little bit about that. All of this is in the book, by the way, and there'll be books out here. If you can buy them, I will... Autograph it? Yes. There you go. I will. Uh, that, but they're $10 a piece. They're 15 on Amazon, but I'll sell them for $10. If you don't have any money, take one. So, but just read. These, it really was miraculous, the things that he did. Channel 39. Channel 39. I hadn't gotten a job. Uh, I was looking for one. I finally went to choir one night. I was singing in the choir now. And on Wednesday nights, uh, we had a guy named uh, Thayer. And Thayer was a little, I think, autistic. And so people kind of avoided sitting with him too long because he, he couldn't, he spoke in broken sentences. Well, he, he came up to me one night and he says, Susan, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something. He said, um, I saw you on television. And I said, you did? He says, no, I see you on television. You're on television. And he kept saying that. And I said, well, where do you see me? He said, when I drive down the street, or sometimes I wake up, and he said, but I see you. You're in front of a camera. You're, you're on television. So I, that was a little puzzling. Well, he, he kept doing this, and it got so about the third or fourth week, 
This happened for six weeks. And about the third or fourth week, uh, he finally was kind of getting on my nerves. I mean, I didn't know what to say to him. You see me on television. Then he wanted me to go to the local cable, like Comcast, or it was Viacom then. And uh, I said, so I'm going to get a bunch of volunteers together to do what I used to have to fight with my professional musicians to do? No, thank you. And the sixth week, he came running into the choir room ahead of everybody. He says, I know what it is. I know what it is. There's a big 39 on the side of the camera. I said, what is 39? He said, that's the local Christian television station. And um, so Sunday, a few days later, I looked at uh, the newspaper and I saw this ad. Somebody was looking at 39 for somebody to come in and, and be the secretary for the station, the kind of an office manager. And so I put all my stuff together. I even put my professional stuff together, my bio, my videos, whatever. Took it in there and handed it to the guy that was there. He was the production manager. And he looked at some of it. And I wasn't home 20, 30 minutes. And I get a call from the station manager who had just come in. And he said, can you come in tomorrow morning and talk to me? And I said, yes. So we sat down, and he said, where did you get that ad? And I said, well, it was in the Sunday paper, in the classifieds. He said, I put that in the paper six months ago, and I took it out about five months ago because we hired somebody for that position. There is no position. And he said, but have you ever thought about doing a talk show? Yeah. You know, thank you, Thayer. Dee, 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 dee. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, do you want to pray about this? And I said, I don't think we need to. <laughs> Let's move on to Corey Ten Boom. Yeah. This was written by, the musical, written by you and your sister. Mm -hmm. right and uh, this is her. Boy. That's Donna. Mm -hmm. She's my baby sister. Mm -hmm. um, How yeah. this all come about? Well, uh, years ago, I had been in Fiddler on the Roof back east when I was not a Christian person, and the whole cast was Jewish. I had the cast party and served them ham, if that tells you how much I... <laughs> that's you how served much them I ham? Did. I served <laughs> ham. Yeah, and you know what? They ate it. <laughs> they did. Yeah, they were really gracious. But um, I played the oldest daughter, Seidel, and I choreographed the play. Well, after I got saved, I thought, why is there... And, and people were bringing me these books, you know, uh, The Hiding Place, and saying, you have faith just like Corey Ten Boom. And uh, I said, who is Corey Ten Boom, you know? So I read her book. And I read all of her books, and I thought, why is there not a musical like Fiddler on the Roof that, with Jesus, you know, that has a real ending, a good ending? And so I kind of was pressed. That was 1985. That tells you how long it took me to get around to moving that to the center of my desk and actually doing the writing on that. Um, because, um, and finally, Donna and I were living together, sharing an apartment, and I said, would you help me? And we sat down and read like seven of her books. I said, you read them, you make lists of scenarios and, and you know, song titles, anything that you think would work in, in the musical, and I'll do the same. And she came up with some amazing things that I hadn't caught. So that's how we did it. And she said, well, I'm not the writer, she said, uh, but I'll critique. Donna's the best fan in the world. She, she gets madder at the movies or happier or whatever. She cries harder. So, and I'm a mechanic. I'm the writer. So I sat down and wrote script, or wrote parts of it, and I'd give it to her. And if Donna cried, if she laughed, if she said no, 
I took that seriously. And that's how we did it. Acquaint us a little bit with the story of Corey Ten Boom and how is that different from the movie? How is the musical mm -hmm. different from mm -hmm. the, the movie? The, the musical is different from the movie. Oh, well. The Hiding Place. Mine has music. Well, but, <laughs> but there, I'm trying to get to the, the spiritual significance of the musical here. <laughs> well, pay attention, pay attention. Pay attention, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, um, do you know who Corey is? Anybody here not know who Corey is? Well, Corey Ten Boom was one of the most faithful, uh, solid Christian women. Now, she was feisty. She was more like me. I could relate to her. She was feisty. Betsy went into that concentration camp with her, no doubt in my mind, because Betsy was dear and solid and walked with Jesus so, so purely. And she would have to say, don't hate Corey. You know, don't be mad, Corey. And, uh, but Corey came out of that prison after Betsy died. <coughs> Corey came out of that prison with that kind of faith, a Betsy faith. And uh, she said, we went on the road together. You know, Betsy was dead. She died in the concentration camp, and there was miracles in there. I don't know, maybe... Tell us about the tiny Bible. The tiny Bible? Mm -hmm. oh, well, that was one of the miracles, um, because they stripped them down. You know, they stripped the women down to, to take them into the showers and whatever. But her sister, Nolly, her second sister, had taken her, uh, sent her a little Bible. See, the whole Ten Boom family was uh, in the resistance. And um, they carried these little Bibles in there, you know, that you could wear a chain around your neck and keep it under your dress. Well, Nolly had sent it to her in the first prison. She was actually in three prisons. Uh, one was more like a jail, so they sent her the Bible. And she would wear it under her dress and read that for comfort. Well, then they sent her to the second. Shebeningen was a terrible prison. But Ravensbrück... That was a death camp. <clears throat> and that's where they sent her last, was to Robinsbrook. But she had been able to uh, get by a whole line of guards in the nude, and nobody saw that Bible because they prayed about it. Betsy, um, Betsy said, I'll pray, and they won't see your Bible. And they didn't. And everything got all chaotic, and they somehow... Got, got in there with, and she had that Bible the whole time. And if they hadn't had that Bible, a whole lot of people would not have come to the Lord because that was the one thing they clung to every night in the concentration camp. And does this sound like a fun musical? <laughs> it is. It really is. There's a lot of victory in uh, Corey's life. And women were coming to the Lord, women that were standing against her in the beginning were coming to her and asking her, I want what you, what you have, because she was so faithful. Let's back up and show some pictures of uh, the Tim Boom house, or the, this is a, the, the uh, was the clock shop, is that correct? I... Uh, it's the clock shop and their home. It's now a museum. Uh, probably what you're seeing here yeah. is today's building. And within this building is the hiding place. Tell us about this. Yeah. Um, the house was a disjointed house. It's a Dutch house. But it was like three houses had been put together over the hundred years that the Ten Booms occupied the home. And so it was real hard to make out how to, well, the Nazis couldn't find this thing. This was up on the third floor, and this is actually Corey's bedroom. And uh, when the uh, resistance people came in, uh, they came and knocked on all the walls and they figured out they could build a wall three feet deep behind her wall. The only way you could get in is you had to crawl under this bottom shelf and they could hold eight people. And there were some vents from the outside that they had some, some air. Of course, this was a wall here that's opening. Yeah, that's just... Just to show you where they hid. But it was all bricked in. 
So when they knocked on the walls, the, the Nazis couldn't find anything. And they never knew about that bottom shelf. It raised up and they could get in. And we have a shot of the uh, Ravensbrook <coughs> uh, prison yeah. fence, and these are some of the women mm -hmm. in the prison. Yes. A terrible place. I was looking on YouTube, uh, some stories about this concentration camp, and just uh, horrendous things took place there. Well, there are some factions out there that would like to say it didn't happen, but it did. And Corey wrote a wonderful book called The Hiding Place about all those experiences. And, and um, of course, you can look on YouTube. And what challenges have you had in trying to place the musical in churches and other venues? What's the resistance? Well, number one, uh, I haven't, uh, my husband and I own a company. Uh, that's my husband over there. Yeah, we have a shot of your husband here, too, if you can't see him here. There, there is him. There he is. He's cute. You originally thought he didn't look like this, correct? That's right. What would you think he looked like? Well, he, <laughs> he called me. He did the printing for Channel 39, and I had never met him. So, But he was a printer, so I figured he was bald. Bald, yes. <laughs> and had like three strands of hair he was hanging on to. And I figured he had inky fingernails and a big belly. Hmm. And well, close. Close. <laughs> but when I met him, I thought, oh gosh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> he was very cute. So, anyway. Right. Back to the challenges. No. The challenges. Yeah, you know, uh, calling these churches, uh, I've sent them all the materials. We have a website called tenboomthemusical.com. And um, so I send them that because it's got all the songs on it. It's actually got the director's script. If you want to read a script, it's a long one. Uh, but it is a big musical. I, I thought Fiddler on the Roof was a big play. This is a big play. And it's got 14 songs that we wrote. And then there's another song that uh, Marty Getz sang um, called Col Nidre. And it's a thousand-year-old song and so that's that's the play and it but it really is joyful because it goes into flashbacks there's there's the time that she lost her first love that wasn't happy but the song is beautiful and uh, then there was the time when she was five years old and her mother uh, led her to Christ at a tea party and she never changed her mind Let's take a look at a short clip from the, uh, from the play. And, uh, this is from Act Two. <laughs> make mistakes. Thank you, Lord, for fleas. This was a God thing with the fleas. The guards would not come in to the, uh, to the facility because of the fleas. Well, and even Corey questioned it. You know, uh, Betsy, old faithful Betsy, she was sure there was a reason for everything. But Corey said, well, I just don't understand why the fleas. Well, that was why the fleas, because the guards never came in while they had their Bible study. And just the way the Lord worked through it. And now some of these churches, when I uh, go to them, a lot of them, and I already find out by researching online, a lot of them are doing Broadway plays. They're not doing uh, Christian witness type plays. And uh, nice plays, good ones, you know. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and Sound of Music and all these, even Fiddler on the Roof. But they're not doing a straight-ahead Jesus thing. Um, 
Corey's faith was amazing. Uh, if you read the last story, the last book, um, The Final Years, you see she walked it right to the end. She was 91 years old. And what I did in the play, uh, the narrator for the play is Corey at 91 years old. And she does it all in flashbacks. So you're seeing Corey at 91, at 21, at 10, at 5, and uh, 45 is the main, the main Corey. Our time has come and gone, Susan. It has come and gone. We have some gifts here, though, for uh, three members of the audience. Have you decided how we can uh, distribute these? You got Act One from the uh, from the play, and also Act Two. This is the audio version, okay. and also a free book. Can anybody name one uh, Corey's other sister? You weren't listening. Nolly. Who said Nolly? Nolly. She okay. gets one. She gets one. You got another one. Another question. Oh. Okay. Or you want to give two to that one person? Uh, what was the name of that second prison? That's a hard one. What was the third one? There you go. Who said it first? Somebody just Hang on to those. These. And a free book. There you go. And a free book. Let's see. Well written book. Okay. No pictures. What are the four words that uh, she said God spoke to her? Well, no, one person. <laughs> you know, one at a time. <laughs> we'll, we'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> well, you all get books. <laughs> Thank you for being with us, Susan. She's been good, huh? We've got a wonderful Stories of Amazing Grace cup in this bag and a gift certificate for you and your husband to eat out somewhere. So I uh, hope you enjoy that. Let's have a prayer before we go, and we'll call it quits. i got a cold hand here. Feel that? Oh, me too. I'm sorry. Okay. Father, we're thankful for uh, Susan's testimony, for you working in her life, for her, so many God things happening where you have shown yourself that you are real and that you are a part of us today. We pray for those who may be watching this on YouTube or listening to an excerpt on the radio, and we pray that uh, perhaps they're seeking a career in the music business, or they're, they're trying to find you but can't find you. We hope that something has been said today that will encourage them in their search for you. Please be a part of their lives and continue to be a part of ours. We pray through your son. Amen.